Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Welcome to another module of Convex Optimization course. In this course module, we will talk about one of the applications of Convex Optimization in the area of signal processing and that is compressive sensing. So we will start with a quick overview of compressive sensing. Later we will formulate compressive sensing problem and then we will look at two solutions to solve this compressive sensing problem. The first one would be orthogonal matching pursuit and later we will look at L1 norm minimization. Okay, let's start with a, a compressive sensing overview. So compressive sensing has been a groundbreaking development in the last 15 to 20 years. It has been used very widely in a variety of applications in different areas of science and engineering including but not limited to uh, image processing, signal processing, medical imaging, computer vision, geophysics, finance, economics, acoustics and wireless communication. Uh, in fact, wherever you have the signal reconstruction problem uh, from noisy measurements or a few number of measurements, so you can employ this compressive sensing framework. So uh, one of the uh, papers that uh, laid the theoretical foundations of this compressive sensing framework uh, is the one that is uh, published by Donohoe uh, and that appeared in tri IEEE Transactions on Information Theory in 2006 and this since then this has been cited around uh, 26,000 times so this area has been research active uh, in the last 15 to 20 years this compressive sensing is also referred to as uh, sparse sampling, sparse sensing, compressive sampling. Uh, so there are different names uh, that appear in the literature. So we also call it uh, sparse sampling. Okay. Before we formally define compressive sensing, let's look at the image uh, of K2. So this is K2 mountain and which is in the northern uh, areas of Pakistan and this is the second highest peak in the world uh, and I think this is around 8611 meters uh, high uh, okay in my computer uh, this image is stored as uh, say 1920 times 1080 pixels and since this is uh, an RGB image and uh, so to store one pixel per color if we use 8-bit coding uh, so we need one byte of storage so in total uh, so if i want to store this image of this size so how many how many pixels do we need how many bytes do we need and so i need one nine two into one zero eight zero pixels times say one byte per color or we have rgb we have three bytes and this roughly amounts to 6.22 megabytes of storage but when I stored this image in fact uh, so it can be stored in around 300 to 400 so we take 400 kilobytes right so how can we store an image in such a smaller size so this is around 1 over 15 times the amount of data we require if we just use this information 6.2 megabyte so the question where how can we store in a smaller size right and the answer is compression so we have compression algorithms that allows us to compress the information to store the large amount of information in a very compact way in a compressed way so, so so what are we doing is so we are sensing a very large amount of data and we are throwing away most of the information so this can be equivalently represented as a system level diagram that we sense a large amount of data so we carry out sensing first and then we compress it that means we throw away most of the information so we're doing compression and this is 
so we call it a classical paradigm of sensing or sampling signal images data sensing is a costly process both in terms of time and pro and price for example in mri so when we reconstruct mri of a patient we take a sensor we take samples of the radiations around uh, on, on a sphere and we take a lot of measurements and it takes a lot of time to to obtain those measurements and uh, it's been always a challenge that uh, we want to reduce the number of samples we require or the amount of time it takes to complete MRI uh, while not compromising the signal reconstruction accuracy. The compressive sensing framework allows us to compress while we sense. So here we are in the classical setting. So we are sensing first and then we are carrying out compression so that we can store the data efficiently. But compressive sensing allows us to carry out compression while sensing and therefore and that's why we call it compressive sensing or compressive sampling so we sample uh, at the same time we compress right so what we're saying is uh, that compressive sensing is sensing and compression at the same time or where we call it compressive sampling, compressive sensing. There are many research questions here. Uh, for example, given number of sensors, how efficiently and accurately we can reconstruct a signal? Or given the signal accuracy, how can we reduce the number of samples we take? We mathematically define a problem under consideration. So we have X. Which we want to reconstruct and so x belongs to say rn and we take the samples of y and we take samples of y as a linear combination of x so x is known to us through a linear combination and that linear combination is represented by this matrix phi and we take this phi matrix say belongs to rm cross n so we say we have m number of measurements and m number of samples and we want to reconstruct n number of the values of the signal x so this phi is referred to as a sensing matrix since this transforms x uh, and we obtain the measurement y here we are just taking a noiseless case and so we are saying we are assuming that so why is not calibrated with any noise or there are no measurement errors so later we'll talk about uh, uh, that how do we deal uh, the situation when we have uh, measurements corrupted with uh, some additive noise okay. so if i define this phi using uh, its rows we say phi has m number of rows so phi one phi two and phi m so we can define that the ith measurement or the ith signal we have yi is given by a projection of x on ith row of and the sensing matrix so, so the problem here is that we want to determine x given y And linear algebra governs us that we require at least m number of n number of samples or m should be greater than or equal to n such that we uniquely determine x from y but the compressive sensing framework allows us to reconstruct signal y from x when m is less than n so we say we have m is less than n so we can reconstruct signal x from y under some assumptions and uh, so let's talk about those assumptions the first assumption is that 
the sensing matrix phi is random or it has some random like sequences or each it simply means that each row of the sensing matrix is linearly independent of the other right so we say the first assumption we have is that sensing matrix phi is random this is an assumption about the sensing matrix so we, we also have assumption on the signal and that assumption in fact forms a basis of this compressive sensing framework and we assume that x is sparse it simply means that most of the entries of x are are zero for example uh, if you take x belongs to say r12 so we say if most of the entries of x are zero only some entries are non-zero so this is a vector in r12 but this is this is this is sparse because only two of the entries of x are uh, non-zero okay. so so what we have is so we have y is equal to phi x so we are assuming that phi is a random sequence and x is sparse we refer to x as k sparse if at most k number of entries of x are non-zero so we say x is k sparse if n minus k or greater than n minus k entries of x are zero so x does not need to be sparse itself so we, we also refer to x as sparse if x can be represented as a linear combination of fewer number of bases so we say if x can be expressed as say x is equal to psi u and if u is sparse uh, so we, we, we also refer to x as sparse so since x can be represented as a fewer number of bases uh, that define this matrix psi so if we use this in uh, in the measurement model so we have y is equal to phi instead of x i write psi x and if i define this phi times psi as phi tilde so in fact this is psi u so phi tilde u so if you see so we have a problem we always have a problem of this form right? and uh, we require this signal to be sparse so here given why we want to reconstruct u and once we have u uh, we know the relationship between u and x uh, we can reconstruct x from u we consider the original problem we have that y is equal to phi x so phi is random and x is sparse so the question here is given y how to reconstruct x and the answer is enforce sparsity because x is sparse so we don't know x so we have fewer moments of y and we have the measurement model so so the answer to this problem is you can have the best x given y if you enforce sparsity while taking into account the measurement model let us now formally define this compressive sensing problem as an optimization problem so what we have is that we want to minimize the zero norm so we'll call it x zero so what is zero norm so zero norm of a vector gives you the number of non-zero entries of a vector so and that is in fact we want to minimize we want to exploit the sparsity and we minimize the number of non-zero entries of x that is equivalent to we're minimizing the sparsity of a vector x subject to the measurement model we have subject to y is equal to phi x 
so we want to determine x in our n such that zero norm is minimized and measurement model is satisfied let me emphasize again that the zero norm is equal into the number of non-zero entries of x so if you have two vectors uh, so i take in r4 so zero zero one zero and I take another vector hundred zero 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 and if you take zero norm of these two vectors uh, so you get one because only one entry of each of these vectors is non-zero so we are not interested in so zero norm uh, does not give you the value of x so we only get the number of non-zero entries so we have an optimization problem in which we want to minimize zero norm subject to y is equal to phi x the measurement model so if you see here equality constraints are fine but the objective function here is is highly non-convex so so we can say the problem here is a non-convex optimization problem so just to emphasize that objective function is non-convex if I draw this objective function in R2 for say I draw zero norm is equal to one and all those points for which zero norm is equal to one in R2 say x1 x2 so these the points in R2 for which zero norm is equal to one would be all of these points in fact so all these points are all these points have zero null one and all of these points also have zero null one and you can clearly see that so this zero norm function is is high non-convex and therefore the optimization problem we have is a non-convex optimization problem we can say a compressive sensing problem in its original form is a non-convex optimization problem and uh, in fact it is np hard so we, 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 we cannot solve it uh, uh, efficiently in terms of computation so if you want to if you want to greedy search uh, so you will and if you know the level of sparsity of k so you would need say n times n choose k so n should be small so n choose k so this would be a computation complexity because you will be have to search all those vectors that has a level of sparsity equal to k uh, in rn uh, and you have to test all those vectors uh, subject to measurement model so and if, if you don't know the level of sparsity and if you sum from k is equal to 0 to n and this turns out to be in fact is equal to uh, 2 to the power n so the computation complexity uh, to solve this uh, non-convex optimization problem grows with uh, the dimension of the x n we have a non-convex optimization problem we will look at two methods to solve this non-convex problem we we'll start with uh, orthogonal matching pursuit so OMP uh, so you can refer to, uh, to this paper uh, for more details about uh, orthogonal matching pursuit there have been there are different variants of uh, orthogonal matching pursuit uh, in the literature so for example we have stage wise uh, OMP and we have a uh, compressed sampling CS OMP and and then we have different robust variants of OMP that allows us to handle with the noise but here we review uh, the one uh, the very very basic version of uh, the orthogonal matching pursuit and you can also see that uh, in fact this paper has also been cited by uh, around uh, 8000 times okay let's talk about uh, this uh, OMP algorithm so how does this OMP algorithm work and how does this iteratively compute or determine 
the signal x from y we recall that we have a problem y is equal to phi x in fact phi x so we given x we want to reconstruct y so let me uh, write down the steps of this orthogonal matching pursuit algorithm and then as we progress i will try to explain the interpretation of each of the steps so we initialize uh, y so i call it y1 so where this superscript indicates the iteration number of the algorithm so initially take y1 is equal to y what do we have right and uh, i initialize iteration number k and i call it uh, one right so in the step one of the algorithm so what we do is so we take the projection of uh, or y with each with each column of the matrix phi so let's say we have a matrix phi and we define using its column uh, say phi 1 is the first column and phi 2 is the second column and so on and so forth so we take a projection of y on every column of phi so let me denote the projection on the jth column of the matrix phi as phi j transpose into y so this is the projection of y on phi j and what we do is we take maximum of uh, this inner product and we want to determine index j for which we have the maximum inner product and we store this index uh, in a vector and i call it lambda so lambda uh, and since k is equal to 1 so lambda would be a vector but since k is equal to 1 uh, so in the first step lambda would be a scalar so so we okay in the first step we determine the index of the column of phi for which we have the maximum correlation uh, with y or we determine the index of the column of phi that has the maximum correlation with y and we store that index in in lambda k and using this this lambda so what we do is so we construct a matrix and let let that matrix is noted by a right and this a would be given by we construct this A by populating A with the columns of phi that are that has a maximum correlation with uh, with this. So we say we have phi, and uh, so I in the subscript I write lambda. Right. So if lambda is scalar, uh, the A would be A would contain one vector. If lambda is if uh, is a vector, uh, say of size uh, p then a would contains p columns of phi right and the best p columns of phi right so that's how we construct uh, this matrix a right and what we do is uh, so using this matrix a so we solve a very simple least square problem in which uh, so we can say we solve y so y at uh, y in fact so no so y so original y will have y minus a into x and x is the first iteration x I, so I just use superscript uh, k with x and the norm here is uh, the equilibrium norm is 2 so we simple so we solve this very simple least square problem and we know that the solution of this least square problem is uh, given by a certain words right that is x of k would be given by say a transpose a inverse 
a transpose y. So that's how um, we obtain xk. So we have this estimate x superscript k. So we use this estimate to determine the residual or the error in step four. So I denoted with uh, say r and uh, with subscript uh, sorry with superscript k and that is given by the error between so y this y is, uh, is the original y so the measurements we have minus sorry k times xk so that's how we determine the residual bit uh, uh, at step four and once we have this residual uh, use this residual in the next iteration as y so we take y at the next iteration as the residual rk and uh, so when we use when we do this we go back to step one and we keep on doing this and uh, and we keep on doing this until unless and uh, we have a, a stopping criterion so we say so keep on doing step one to step four until uh, the residual error converges to zero or we can say you mean rk so residual at iteration k minus iteration so residual at iteration k minus one and we take equilibrium norm of uh, this residual and when this decreases uh, when this is less than or equal to some say epsilon so we can say that that, that is a stopping criterion or you just simply break uh, uh, this loop of uh, iterations from step one to step four so that's how uh, should determine and that's how uh, this algorithm uh, iterates uh, and it determines uh, the estimate xk so what we have is so when this algorithm breaks so, so what do you have so you have already determined uh, this lambda right so say you have uh, k number of iterations capital k number of iterations and we say after uh, capital k number of iterations so lambda would be given by a vector in rk so this lambda contains the indices of the columns of y you also obtain the matrix a and vector x after k number of iterations so what will be the size of the matrix a so since lambda belongs to rk so matrix a contains the k number of columns so we say the vec the matrix a belongs to so m number of rows and capital k number of columns after k iterations of the algorithm and the estimate x the vector x you obtain is so x would be given by x belongs to r k as well right and this x is such an x for which we have y minus a so i call it xk xk is minimized in the least square sense so it's less than or equal to uh, epsilon say so epsilon naught so we note here that in constructing a we have not utilized all the columns of phi so the in, in total we have n columns of phi but out of those n columns we have determined we have extracted the best capital k number of columns of uh, phi and using those k number of columns we have constructed this this matrix a so but which of those columns we have used and that information is stored in this lambda so lambda 
uh, if you recall so in the algorithm so lambda was storing the information about uh, the best column of phi that has the maximum correlation with y or residual in each equation so that's how we determine lambda right so so what we, what do we have now so we have uh, xk that it belongs to rk but instead uh, so we were rather interested in determining x in fact so we have xk and we want to determine x so using this xk we can determine x the entries of x are given by we have 0 0 and uh, so the first uh, entry of xk the estimate we have obtained so we call it xk1 and then we have 0 and then we have x k two. So this entry, which is the first entry of the estimate we have obtained after k number of iterations. So this appears at an index. Which index? Where we have the maximum uh, contribution of the columns of phi, and that information is stored in lambda. So this appears at lambda at 1 and the index of this entry is lambda of 2 and so on and so forth so for all other columns of phi for all other columns of phi that have not been indexed in lambda that do not contribute significantly to y or that has zero or negligible contribution in y so we have obtained a sparse x from y using this orthogonal matching pursuit algorithm or OMP. Let me explain the intuition of this OMP algorithm. We wanted to enforce sparsity. We wanted to minimize zero norm of our x we want to reconstruct. We do this by projecting y to the columns of phi and we do this in this in this step one so we project y to the max to the columns of phi and we choose a column that has the maximum correlation with y and using that column of maximum projection we construct matrix a in step two and then in step three what do we do so we use the columns of maximum projection and find the contribution of that column in least square sense so this xk give us the contribution of the columns of phi in y in least square sense and once we have that contribution we use the contribution to determine the residual and we keep on doing this until the residual goes to zero or the algorithm converges so that's how uh, OMP works and gives you uh, the solution uh, that kind of enforces sparsity. Now we look at one more method to solve the original compressive sensing problem that is non-convex in nature. So we look at L1 norm minimization. So this solution handles the original problem in a very innovative, in a very different way and in fact this has been utilized this has been explored this has been investigated very extensively in the literature so let's uh, uh, start with the formulation of original problem we had so we we want to minimize so l0 norm of x subject to the measurement model we have So y is equal to phi x. So it's a, there's a fundamental result in compressive sensing that if we change this L0 norm, L1 norm, 
we can still obtain uh, a solution that is very close to the zero norm solution and in fact uh, under some conditions and with high probability uh, we can solve this L0 norm minimization problem as L1 norm minimization problem. So we say that uh, this L0 norm minimization problem can be formulated as L1 norm minimization. So we can start solving this. If we solve minimize L1 norm subject to y is equal to phi x. So this is uh, usually called as uh, L1 relaxation of uh, the non-convex problem. And if you see in this problem, the objective function is convex subject to affine equality constraints and therefore this problem is a convex optimization problem uh, and therefore this can be solved very efficiently in fact this l1 minimization can be formulated as a linear program uh, by simply using epigraph reformulation technique so let me quickly formulate this as lp so if we have so we know that we can write one norm as so that is defined as uh, so x1 plus x2 the sum of the absolute values right so if i define each of these x1 x2 as a new variable t so if i introduce a variable t uh, corresponding to absolute value of x1 so i can write this as uh, simply t1 plus t2 plus tn and uh, if i define a vector of all ones i can write as one transpose t so l1 norm minimization can be written as minimize so one transpose t subject to so we had a measurement model that is y is equal to phi x and then we will have uh, more equality constraints uh, for this epigraph reformulation technique so we can write uh, that each x1 absolute in fact x i is equal to p i and for i is equal to 1 2 2 n so in fact each of these uh, can be written as that x i is less than or equal to t i or minus x of i is less than or equal to ti and that's how uh, we can convert this uh, equality constraint and uh, that is not linear uh, so into these two inequality constraints and so we have different phi is equal to one two two and and to see this objective function is linear uh, we have a fine equality constraints and here we have uh, in fact a fine inequality constraints so this is in fact lp so that's how we can solve l1 norm minimization problem subject to measurement model as a simple linear program lp we yet need to answer that how does a solution of l1 norm minimization is also a solution of l0 norm minimization to answer this question we quickly review the geometric interpretation of l1 norm minimization 
in L1 norm minimization. So we minimize L1 norm subject to a fine equality constraints defined by our measurement model. So, so we're minimizing L1 norm subject to a fine equality constraints. And we know that a fine equality constraint refers to the hyperplane. So the solution of L1 norm minimization is an intersection of L1 norm ball, so one norm ball and hyperplane. So if we draw the norm ball, so the one norm ball in R2, so and that is given by simply this is this is one norm ball in R2 and um, and you can view the extension of this in, in high dimensions and and if you see uh, so what good thing about this one norm ball is that this is not smooth if you look at norm 2 ball so the norm 2 ball is smooth but this one norm ball is not smooth due to the non smoothness of one norm ball so any solution that lies on the boundary of this is also lies on the corner and or we can say the intersection of hyperplane and one norm ball would always be one of these corners and if you recall when we drew zero norm ball so we always wanted to find the solution that lies on either of these lines defining the boundary of the quadrants so when we minimize l1 norm so we always find a solution uh, around these corner points and this non smoothness of one norm ball uh, in fact enables that the solution of L1 norm minimization problem uh, is also a solution of L0 norm minimization uh, under some assumptions and uh, but and also with high probability. I should highlight again that the solution of L2 norm minimization is not a solution of L0 norm minimization and that is because of the smoothness of the norm 2 ball. So here we have the norm 2 ball in, in R2. So we can say that the, when the intersection of this norm to ball and hyperplane uh, does not need to be at either of these either of these points uh, that define the boundary of uh, the quadrants and therefore l2 norm minimization is not as is not equivalent to l0 norm minimization but l1 norm minimization due to the non smoothness of a norm one ball uh, allows us uh, to relax the l0 norm minimization and solve it as l1 norm minimization this non smoothness of l1 norm ball enforces sparsity and this non smoothness allowed us to reformulate a problem l0 norm minimization that is highly non-convex as a very simple linear program and this was a revolution that enabled significant amount of research in the last 15 to 20 years that a problem that is highly non-convex can be solved very efficiently as a linear program let's also talk about uh, a case when the measurements are corrupted with noise so say we have a measurement model that is given by phi is equal to phi x. So this is what we uh, talked about uh, earlier that y is equal to phi x. And now we say that the measurements y the sensing is corrupted by additive noise n. So n is the noise, uh, phi is a sensing matrix, x is a signal we want to reconstruct and so y are the measurements. So to solve this problem, uh, so we minimize a linear combination of 
L1 norm uh, to enforce sparsity and uh, we also at the same time we minimize uh, the difference between y and phi x in least square sense so we minimize y minus uh, phi x so least squares so the measurement model uh, plus lambda times uh, l1 norm So this is uh, in fact called as a uh, basis pursuit denoising. Here lambda refers to a regularization parameter. So we take so we say lambda as a regularization parameter and that has to be determined for a problem under consideration. So in fact this problem is a regularized version of the original uh, L1 norm minimization problem in the absence of noise. We summarize this module. We started with the formulation of compressive sensing problem and we formulated the problem as a non-convex optimization problem that is L0 norm minimization problem subject to the measurement model. Since the problem is non-convex, it is NP-hard, uh, we, we cannot solve it uh, efficiently. We looked at two different solutions to solve non-convex problem. The first one was orthogonal matching pursuit, OMP algorithm, that iteratively computes a solution. And then we talked about L1 norm minimization, in which we relax the L0 norm minimization and formulate a L1 norm minimization problem and which can be uh, also formulated as a linear program and since it, it is LP we can solve it very efficiently. Later we talked about a compressive sensing problem in the presence of noise and we formulated that as a minimization problem in which we minimize a linear combination of uh, the least square term and one norm in fact that is called basis pursuit denoising we stop here and we will continue in the next module thank you very much for your time